Time to look at what was the legendary Arlie Ermey's most famous role. We're smart and my He told me enough. No, I Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here, and I am here with a brand new movie review. And this movie review is going to be for a film from Stanley Kubrick, and this is going to be a war film he made in the 80s. This was the film he did after The Shining, and it was one of the last films that was released during his prime time. And that film is going to be for none other than what was 1987's Full Metal Jacket. This is also going to be the third Stanley Kubrick review on this channel. So, what's this film about? Well, this movie is a two-look segment, two-segment look at the effect of the military mindset and war itself on Vietnam-era Marines. The first half follows a group of recruits in boot camp under the command of the punishing gunnery surgeon Hartman. The second half shows one of those recruits, Joker, covering the war as a correspondent for Stars and Stripes, focusing on the Tet Offensive. So yeah. Well... How was this movie made? Well, in early 1980, Kubrick contacted Michael Hurt, author of the Vietnam War Memorial Dispatches from 1977, to discuss work on a film about the Holocaust, but Kubrick discarded that idea in favor of a film about the Vietnam War. Hurt and Kubrick met in England, and Kubrick told Hurt he wanted to make a war film, but had yet to find a story to adopt. And Kubrick discovered Gustav Hart's as for his novel The Short Timers while reading the Kirk Kirkus Review. Her received the novel in Bound Galleys and thought of it as a masterpiece that in 1982, Kubrick wrote the novel twice and he concluded it was a unique, absolutely wonderful book and decided to adopt it for his next film. According to Kubrick, he was drawn to the book's dialogue, which he found almost po poetic and its carved out stark quality. And in 1983, Kubrick began researching for the film and he watched Archibald footage and documentaries. He read Vietnamese newspapers on microfilm from the Library of Congress and studied hundreds of photographs from the era. Initially, Herr was not interested in revisiting his Vietnam War experiences, and Kubrick spent three years persuading him to participate, describing the discussions as a single phone call lasting three years with interruptions. Then in 1985, Kubrick contacted Hasward and invited him to join the team. And he talked to Hasward by telephone three to four times a week for hours at a, at a time, and Kubrick had already written a detailed treatment of the novel. And Kubrick and her met at Kubrick's home every day, breaking the treatment into scenes. Her then wrote the first draft of the film's script, and Kubrick worried that the audience might misread the book, misread the book's title as a reference to people who did only half a day's work and changed it to Full Metal Jacket after coming across the phrase in a gun catalog. After the first draft was complete, Kubrick telephoned his orders to Hasford and her, who mailed the submissions to him. Kubrick read and edited Hasford's and Hart's submissions, and the team repeated the process, and neither Hasford nor her knew how much each had contributed to the screenplay, and it led to a dispute over the final credits, and Hasford even said that they were like guys on a stimuli in the car factory. He was putting on one widget, and Michael would be putting on another widget, and Stanley was the only one who knew that this was going to end up being a car. And Hurst said Kubrick was not interested in making an anti-war film, but he wanted to show what war was, what war was like. And at some point, Kubrick wanted to meet Hasford in person, but her advice against this, because he described the short timer's author as a scary man, and did not believe Hasford and Kubrick would get on well, get along well. And Kubrick, however, insisted on the meeting, though, and it occurred at his house in England. The meeting went poorly, obviously, and he, and Hasford never met with Stanley Kubrick again. So yeah, after the film was fully completed, then completely advertised and and. Finished to the public, Warner Brothers then released Full Metal Jacket into the United States on June 26, 1987. And it was the last of, of Kubrick's films to be released during his lifetime. And of course, the movie received critical acclaim. It grossed $120 million worldwide against a budget of $16 million. And it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Adopted Screenplay for Kubrick, Carr, and Hasford. Then 2001, the American Film Institute placed the film at number 5 in its poll titled AFI's 100 Years, 100 Thrills. Yeah. 
and it's since been, been known as one of the best war films since, ever since its release, and have and often been over parodied in a lot of other pop culture media. Now as for my reaction, well, I hear I say, this is easily one of my favorite war films, and it's my fourth favorite film from Stanley Kubrick. I've always loved Kubrick's films I've seen, like I've loved 2001 Space Odyssey, loved The Clockwork Orange, loved The Shining, all three of these films are even some of my favorite films of all time. This movie could probably, may not reach out mark, but it's definitely one of the favorite war films. And rest in peace with Stanley Kubrick. This guy was a really talented director. When people think of this film, they usually view it as a two films or a two part. Like the first movie, or first half, is the one that's the most remembered of all of them, which is the first movie set in the boot camp. And then you have kind of the sequel, which is the Vietnam War. And usually people like the boot camp stuff the most, while the Vietnam stuff gets kind of a more mixed response. The boot camp portion of the film is what most people remember. You got the iconic drill instructor played by Lar Arlie Ermey, which is really literally his most iconic was the most iconic role of his career, and it's definitely and it was definitely one of the most terrifying, moving, funny, and convincing performances in history, as it's well known by a lot of people. And virtually a nonstop rant from his first appearance to his latest, he electrifies the performances around and puts the viewer in boot camp with the rest of the recruits. And Vincent D. Onof Onofrio does well as Private Pile overacting in only one scene, though it is definitely a critical scene. Matthew Maldit's performance is almost territory to Army and Dion Onofrio's performance, and we do we do get to see him develop a little, and the positive characteristics that will make him strong in Vietnam. And his second portion blends 60s rock and roll and Vietnam urban warfare to tremendous effect, and the war effort is crumbling, and reporters starting to joker are sent to front to support inventory and get stories of the stars and stripes, and their Joker confronts the full effects of war on itself, himself, friends, and strangers. Like, one is hard-pressed to remember at points that it's just this movie, though. In some comfortable and real, definitely the actors do look in their surroundings. And a door gunner, door gunner like, Ramble Mother, 8-Ball, and Cowboy are consumed by their roles. And So, yeah, most of the movie we're following Joker. The first movie is him in boot camp. The sequel is him now on the Vietnam War is where the Vietnam War stuff really happens. And usually, Kubrick's films are generally more accessible and mainstream than he is often given credit for. And as gritty as unflinching as his take on the Vietnam War is, this is definitely his most mainstream work. Like, Kubrick usually gives us a grunt-side view of military training and combat in a war that was particularly unpopular and well-documented, and this was the first war to be fully televised on TV. And Kubrick even pokes fun at the soldiers' awareness of this. Now the dubious nature of the propaganda put up with the military's own frontline reporting, we get a world whirlwind tour speckled with dark humor as well, an excellent use of pop music, and brutal sequences of hard edge violence. I mean, this one's the this one's probably I think of all the films though, this might have to be the least violent he's really done. Because it's really not that violent. I mean, it's not like Clockwork Orange, and it's not where disturbing like The Shining. Or nowhere is kind of like dark as Fouls and Want a Space Odyssey. So this is probably easily the least probably the least dark of all the works he's done. Still have not seen Eyes Wide Shut yet, but I've heard it's like two and a half hours long. But I should I should probably watch that shit and I. Tell me the cons tell me any Kubrick fans in the cons below, tell me if I should watch Eyes Wide Shut. When I get the chance. But back to this review. During the first part of this movie, which is set in the train camp, the memorable stuff for the phony, tough, and crazy brave, Sergeant Hartman literally cites Lee Harvey Oswald as an exemplary U.S. Marine marksman, and his scene perfectly illustrates the total reversal of moral standards and modern warfare. And the first half is really anchored by the great performances of Arlie, Ermy, and Vincent D'Arnfaro. They're just incredible in this movie. The Matthew Modine leads completely, but it's like mesmerizing directions from Stanley Kubrick, and it's always, it, and it's impossible to lose interest during your second during some of the second half, in my opinion. Though, some people may want it to be more obviously anti-war and probably don't like it for that reason, but it's not quite so blatant. It's mur it's kind of murky, just like what I imagine the Vietnam War experience clearly was back then, and the long unconceded part of an impressive feel. 
It's even strange that the Vietnam battlefield looks more like a World War II European battlefield, but I'm sure Kubrick has reasons for it. Kubrick manages to put many other weird, unique situations in this movie like he does with a lot of his films, and it makes this movie a truly unusual viewing experience that shall leave quite an impression on you. And only a brilliant man like Stanley Kubrick could come up with these kind of scenes. And despite the honest level of the movie, the movie still manages to impress a more casual viewer. And the battle sequences are made with lots of profession with some beautiful cinematography and great use of music. And I think of all the characters of this movie, we all know that Arlie Ermey gives the greatest performance as Sergeant Hartman. And Sergeant Hartman is one of the most memorable characters of cinema, the most memorable characters of any war movie, and has so many great memorable lines in this film that are just hilarious and enjoyable to watch. Some of which, one of these actually became a meme. It's this scene, when they're standing on the boxes, and Hartman orders Polly to get off the box because he sees it unlocked, and he searches the box. And he finds a jelly donut. How does the scene go? Holy Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? What is that private pile? Sir, a jelly donut, sir. A jelly donut? Sir, yes, sir. How did it get here? Sir, I took it from the mess hall, sir. Is chow allowed in the brackets, private pile? Sir, no, sir. Are you allowed to eat jelly donuts, private pile? Sir, no, sir. And why not, private pile? Sir, because I'm too heavy, sir. Because you were a disgusting, fat body, private pile. Sir, yes, sir. Then why did you try to sneak a jelly donut in your foot locker, private pile? Sir, because I was hungry, sir. Because you were hungry? Private Pile has dishonored himself and dishonored the platoon. I have tried to help him, but I have failed. I have failed because you have not helped me. You people have not given Private Pile the proper motivation. So from now on, whenever Private Pile fucks up, I will not punish him. I will punish all of you. And the way I see it, ladies, you owe me for one jelly donuts. Now get on your faces. Open your mouth. They're paying for it. You eat it. Ready? Exercise. And another moment is in the beginning scene where he meets Joker. Oh shit, what have we got here? Fucking comedian, private Joker. <laughs> like, like after this movie, Arlie Ermey went on to get many other great roles. Like, uh, many of us Pixar fans know him as Sarge in the Toy Story films, the leader of the Green Soldiers, and some of, a lot of us horror fans know him. As, as corrupt Sheriff Hoyt in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. The remakes, anyways. I almost forgot to mention that. The remake duology. And if you've seen Kubrick's other movies, you probably know he definitely pulls no punches. And believe, and believe me, he doesn't hear either. We usually talk about the first and second parts of the movie, but one might say that even the second half has two halves. When they first arrive in Saigon, when they actually go into battle, and war was kind of the only subject, really, that Stanley Kubrick seemed to come back to over and over again. And the film combines some of the satirical humor that made Dr. Strangelove apparently this classic with a brilliant objective eye to that he trained war on the paths of glory. It's a story, it's kind of like a story that the making of a killer from boot camp to the wrecked urban landscape of Vietnam. Matthew Modine plays the primary character Joker, and you see Vincent D'Alfino giving the wonderful performance as Pyle, or the wonderful and tragic performance as Pyle. Here. And it's not really a movie for about individual people, though. It's a movie about the loss of identity and individually in the context of indoctrination in life or death struggles. Like, as in Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, the characters are only a mechanism for the themes of the film. And it's a deliberately anti-melodramatic film that seeks to create its own formula, and the idea is more to transparent you as the viewer into the environment, and not to allow us to easily use separation between self and experience that a strong protagonist would have afforded us, though. And Kubrick definitely likes fighting performances from his actors. Like in a lot of his movies. During, and usually we have a frightening character in all of his movies. In 2001 Space Odyssey, you have HAL 9000. In Clockwork Orange, you have Alex and his Droogs. In The Shining, you have Jack Torrance. In this one, you have Hartman and Joker and Animal Mother. They're paired with dramatic lighting from Moonlight and Ruinous Flames, and nearly every scene of dangerous a sense of dread over what might happen next. But character and setting are just part of the equation. The script powerfully employs violence to display the potential for the human spirit to decay. The violence starts among the recruits, and in the end, the fresh marines do not see the difference between civilian and combatant. And everyone, and everyone literally not wearing green apparently dies in this film. And I think of all the characters, I feel like Pyle is the character you feel bad for most in the film. 
mainly because usually he's the one that gets the most shit from Hartman, mainly for not being war material, and then becomes nearly hated by all the trainees after the jelly donut scene, to the point where they basically whack him with blankets for no good reason. And this pretty much causes him to start losing his sanity to the point where he becomes so obsessed with his gun, refuses to let it go. And then their final scene at the boot camp, when they're about to leave for the Vietnam War, at the very end of the first half, he straight up shoots Hartman on their final day and then shoots himself. Pretty much pulling that pulling pretty much pulling the I'm taking you with me on Hartman. Because it's clear Hartman, wherever Pyle's going, Hartman's going with him. And Cooper's direction is masterful. These are moments like throughout. There's tracking shots, behavioral quick quirks of minor characters, the dialogue of a dying Vietnamese, the hiring of Laurie Ermey, and that's in the master of his field scream. In one scene, a lieutenant is asked about casualties as he stands next to a war grave, unaware of what, about, of what to do, and he constantly stops and smiles for the camera, which is a horrific just opposition given the horror just behind him. And we even get references of the whole Mickey Mouse March song throughout this movie. Two in a lot of times. I forget. Yeah. And the originality in Kubrick's film is that he doesn't present the war as a hell where humans are sent to being slaughtered on the contrary to the majority of war films. Blood's here considering as a god. And the ditch on me and the structure permits to distinguish the dogmatic part and the fanatic one. The religious presentation of the situation implies that the film is not the story of one person discovering the war. It's a real fresco of the soldiers. We're confronted with the ones who live killing, the ones who are disgusted, the ones who become Mac because they couldn't stand what they were doing. This blood is omnipresent, and it's a powerful and evil character. Not just as a way to shock people, no. It actually feels like the blood in this movie is an actual character, and actually symbolizes the, kind of symbolizes the characters in this film, in a way. And the most important and stunning part of Kubrick's work, though, is that he manages to describe the atmosphere in this very odd period, split between the horror of the war and the social progresses of the 60s, the film of superposition of contrast between good and bad, silence and noise, color and gray, calmness and violence. And for example, though, Kubrick's alters long shots and very rapid cuts to oppose the cohesion and the hatred between soldiers, and music that is nearly absent of the movie appears once in the second part and is in total contradiction with the horrors of the images shown. A paroxysm of those contracts is when the soldiers joke about John Wayne on the battlefield, though. And the movie even ending with Joker's narration and them singing the Mickey Mouse March song again. However, I do agree that the movie definitely does have some nitpicks. And why it's not nearly as good as, like, The Shining and Clockwork Orange in 2001. At first off, it's obvious. Yeah, the second half is not really that memorable compared to the more iconic greatness of the first half that people seem to remember the most. And at times, the film doesn't really just fit together. Sometimes it'll show some unrelated, some not very well-related material. It loses its pace near the beginning of the second half, but it recovers a little later in the movie. And the Joker's narration for the movie kind of just goes nowhere, and it's kind of horribly told. I'm not saying, I'm not saying I don't think it's terrible, because I still thought Modine was a good performance as Joker, but the narration just sounds like he reads it off of flashcards. And the first thing I mentioned... And also, throughout the movie, I really feel bad for Private Pyle. And, it, and his treatment just gets worse later on the film. It kind of seems like he is Hartman's main victim, mostly just because Hartman thinks he's worthless throughout the film. And, and honestly, I can't... And well. Hartman was a good character. Can't really say I feel bad for him when he got shot. Because honestly, I think what happened to Hartman was well-deserved. With how I treated Private Paul, he kind of did all this to himself. He kind of got himself killed. Drove him to madness, turned the whole camp against him. Pretty much death came to claim him the final day of the final day of his cruise training. Grim Reaper pretty much took took a man of pile and then shot Hartman and took and pretty much took Hartman to hell with them. And then left Pyle the minute Pyle shot himself. So Hartman kind of deserved what he got. Despite being a good character. And finally, I feel the ending is definitely anticlimactic. Where the ending, how it ends is that 
Assuming command, the squad machine gunner M Mother leads an attack on the sniper. The Joker locates her first though, but his M16 rifle jams, alerting the sniper of his presence. As the sniper opens fire, she's revealed to be a teenage girl, and Rafferman shoots her, wounding her mortally. As the squad coverages on the sniper, she begs for death, leads an argument over whether or not to kill her. And old mother agrees to be a mercy killing, but only if Joker does it. And after some hesitation, Joker shoots her. And as night falls, the Marines return to Camp City in the Mickey Mouse March. And a narration of Joker's thoughts conveys that despite being in a world of shit, he's glad to be alive and no longer afraid. So, the bright side of the ending? Glad that Joker didn't get shot and die. And, and for once, it's nice to see a Stanley Kubrick film not end on a complete downer note. For a change and maybe end with some kind of optimism. Because most of his endings usually have been downer endings. Clockwork Orange kind of ends on a downer because Alex is going to go back to his life of crime soon. The Shining King ends on a downer because Jack Torrance ends up dying, freezing to death in the maze. And it kind of seems like he's... And pretty much he's now part of the ghosts now. The ghosts have successfully claimed him. Now when he died pretty much alone... That was the one Space Odyssey I don't, I don't remember much of, because I haven't seen it in a long time. But this one, this one at least kind of ends on a more bittersweet note, where Joker survives, but I honestly still don't think it's that complete of an ending, because I kind of wish we still show them returning home, but it is what it is. Sure, now Full Metal Jacket may not be the number one best war film ever, but it's still a great film, and it's still one of the best war films ever, just not the number one best. It has a good story. Another brilliant direction by Stanley Kubrick, and interesting characters. In the end, Full Metal Jacket is without a doubt to watch and buy for any Kubrick or War fans. Without a doubt, for sure. Sorry, I said that twice. And those who want to see the role that made Arlie Ermey famous, and see one of Kubrick's last films that he released in his prime time. Anyways, that's it for my review of Full Metal Jacket. When you're hungry, Full Metal Jacket, here's how I'm going to rank this movie. So overall, if you love Warren Kubrick, then you will totally enjoy the hell out of this film and get a good kick out of all of Ermi's scenes. And if you're wondering how I'm going to rank Full Metal Jacket, I am going to give Full Metal Jacket a 9 out of 10. And there we go. That pretty much wraps up my review for Full Metal Jacket. And now you're wondering something. Well, our next review is going to be for, if you're wondering what the next review is, the next review is going to be for an A224 film. And, well, the good side. It's one of my favorite films from them, and it's definitely one of their most, their non-horror, and probably, yeah, it's one of their non-horror films. And made a kid actor famous. On the bad side. This one, well... It stars an actress I know most of most of you guys and me lost respect for. But this is one of those films where you separate art from the artist. So just keep that in mind. You'll find out when I review it. But until then, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank you all for watching. If you like this one to see more, don't forget to like, subscribe to Donji Corleone. <laughs>